I'd like to really begin by sincerely thanking, thanking Gil Stein for inviting me here to the OI. I know we're not in his building now, but we're sort of in the virtual OI for this evening. And to Amy and all of the team in the OI for their help and getting you all here tonight. I'm going to talk through the results of a whole series of case studies that we've been doing at the BM, which have been very collaborative, involving scientists, conservators, and many curators, to illustrate, I think, why in museums, objects need help to tell the stories that they can tell. So we're all familiar with some of these questions. How was it made? What was it used for? What, why does it look like that now? How do we know? And these, along with many other questions, are common in archaeology and museums alike. But in order to answer them, we have to keep thinking of new techniques and ways of answering them. So framing good questions, having an understanding of what science can do and can't do, I mean, working collaboratively, uh, developing a relatively robust data set, publishing the results as quickly as we can, and maximizing the knowledge through effective dissemination, uh, effective for the questions that you're asking, are really critical and underpin all research. So I'm, a lot of what I'm going to talk about are exhibition-driven questions on a wide range of objects covering quite a wide range of periods, uh, both from within the British Museum collection and from the collections of the National Museum of Afghanistan that we were very lucky to work on together. And to show how these case studies have thrown completely new light, I think, on aspects of polychromy, uh, manufacturing techniques for certain types of object, and even the functions, perhaps, of certain types of object uh, from ancient Mesopotamia, that is to say Iraq and northeastern Syria, uh, Iran, and Afghanistan. So that's a view of our current gallery for ancient Iran, the Rahim Irvani Gallery. And I, I'll quickly throw this out because I've learned a lot from my mistakes. I've been fortunate enough to have had three goes at developing a gallery for ancient Iran in the BM. The first was on a learning curve of zero to one year when it had to open, and it was a disastrous gallery in hindsight. You know, made a hell of a lot of mistakes, which some people were kind enough to point out to me, um, and some I found out afterwards. And then the second gallery opened a year after that, and that lasted a decade. And this is the third gallery that opened in 2007. And I think one of the things I learned really the hard way is that it's really tough sometimes to tell good stories with some archaeological material. The pots and potsherds and fragmentary detritus that most ancient people leave. Because when you put that next to really good quality stuff, no one looks at the potsherds. <laughs> and it's, so we really deliberately tried to inform the public through the web, through labels, panels, publications, based on research behind the scenes and showing how whole vessels or high value things can also give good results. So I'm going to begin by answering this, one of these perennial questions of how was it made? To be frank, most archaeologists and curators are not skilled craftsmen. And in order to understand how something's made, we rely on direct observation, um, occasionally combined with scientific techniques, or the results of replication and experimental archaeology. And a good understanding of how objects were made not only characterizes the level of technological ability in any one society and the parameters of ancient craftsmen, but also create means of cross-cultural comparison 
which are independent of style. Now, one of the techniques we've been using is um, zero radi radiography, so x-rays, basically. Um, we've got in-house facilities for that. It's very quick, it's non-destructive, and it's very effective in showing how certain types of objects were made, if they're composites, and where the differences in structure, physical structure of the object, might lie. And from that, uh, understand better how it was made. It's particularly useful for the analysis of certain types of metalware. And over the course of the past two decades, um, most of our ancient Iranian silver, which was gathered together in that first slide, and some of the pieces in the Oxus treasure, which is a fantastic collection of mainly 5th century BC Achaemenid material from the, near the border of Afghanistan and Tajikistan that we have in the BM. And we've analyzed most of this material using zero radiography and published most of the results as separate papers. I choose this object to begin um, because it featured in Neil McGregor's A History of the World, which some of you may have heard as a, a radio series, or even read the book. And we expected, despite all denials, that this exhibition, well, sorry, this radio series would turn into an exhibition. They, they always do. So we decided, we wanted to know exactly how this object that featured in the, in the radio series was made and what the conservation implications of that analysis might be so that we could either say yes or no to the exhibition loan request that was going to follow. So it's a wonderful little thing. It's about the size of the palm of my hand. Um, it's not quite a unique object because we have a fragmentary second example from the Oxus treasure in the BM. So it's a high-end object made somewhere within the Achaemenid Empire, we don't know exactly where, that is a miniature version of a type of chariot represented uh, at full scale almost on reliefs at Persepolis, as well as in other forms of Achaemenid art. That's what it looks like when you x-ray it. Um, it was slightly frightening really because it showed that the object is more fragile than an egg that's been sucked dry of its contents. It could be crushed easily within the hand. The horses are hollow. They're made from in two halves soldered down the back with the legs and the tails separately made and inserted into the hollow horse's body. Uh, the reins are single pieces of wire that have been pulled and twisted and attached loosely to the horses and to the hands of the guy in the cab of the chariot. The figures are made separately and attached to the to solid sheets of gold that form the cab of the chariot. And then the wheels are made from lots of separate elements, so the hub, the spokes, and the, um, the circumference of the wheel are made from separate strips of gold with granules attached around the outside of the wheel to imitate the, the reinforced treads of the, the original. So it's an extraordinarily complex piece of composite workmanship involving a, a really quite a high degree of craftsmanship. Um, the gold itself is of very high purity. Um, and it still doesn't answer where it was made, but at least we now know a lot more about how it was made and the level of fragility inherent in, in the final product. Now, I've said we've also used radiography to analyze a lot of the silverwares. Um, a lot of these are plates or deep bowls and almost all of them have a small centering point, which is a lot of people don't really notice, on the, the back in the center. In the literature, people have sometimes regarded this as evidence of um, spinning the metal on a lathe or even casting. 
Um, but the radiographs show very clearly um, that they're all made by very carefully hammering single pieces, circular pieces of sheet metal. And the centering point is about where the craftsman knows how to basically trace out the design that he, or maybe she, then hammer out and then trace using engraving tools. So this is a silver bowl, as you can see, from northern Iran. A wonderful thing. And repeated with a radiograph on the right. So the principles of radiography, which I'm sure all of you know, is that if it's darker, it, it has um, almost no density left in the piece. And so if it's very dark, it's almost see-through. And in the case of the silver bowl, the lobes have been hammered so thin that they are slightly thinner than the average piece of paper. Uh, and the engraved um, sections between the lobes are visible as outlines. So the results are important not just in showing how this object was made through hammering, uh, but also underlines how fragile it is. If you drop a plate like that on a surface like we have in this room, it is not like dropping something out of your average kitchen on the kitchen floor and you'll pick it up and it'll be fine. It will shatter like glass. So ancient silver is heavily embrittled and deeply fragile. Uh, and so that's really important for working with conservators and packers when we move these things around. Um, we also analyzed the silver of these vessels using a different technique, um, X-ray fluorescence, and that indicates almost invariably a very high purity for achaemenid silver of 95 to 97% purity. So they're um, uh, probably refining the material and valuing the finished products as much for their purity of metal as for the aesthetics or the function of the object. They can literally turn this finished vessel back into something that can be used in monetary transactions as they chop it up and barter and sell uh, by the weight of the silver fragments. Now, the next object that I want to illustrate um, we were f fortunate to um, have temporarily, as it was on loan to us at the British Museum from the National Museum of Afghanistan, as part of this wonderful traveling exhibition of um, um, material from the National Museum. And it's a, a double gold clasp found in a circa first century tomb at the site of Tilia Tepe in the northern part of Afghanistan. It's one of, if you count the pair as one object, is one of almost 20,000 objects found in six tombs at that site. And it shows two figures generally regarded as wearing Greco-Macedonian war costume, which are very anomalous in the rest of the grave assemblages, which are typified by links to the inner Asian step of the Russian steppe in Siberia, and the world of the nomad rather than of the earlier um, Greek city-states of Afghanistan to which the style of this piece belongs. So it's always been considered a bit of a, an anomaly. We had a long series of discussions with our Afghan colleagues about whether we could analyze pieces non-destructively, of course, when they were on loan to us. And these discussions, if you've ever worked with Afghans, were not only lengthy, but deeply democratic. So we would talk through a committee of eight, listen to all of the discussion answers. They would all agree that they couldn't make a decision. We would call the director of the National Museum of Afghanistan on a mobile. Each of them would talk in turn. And the director of the museum would say, well, we can't make a decision. We must call the deputy minister. So we would ring the deputy minister. I think you know where this is going. And he said, no, we can't make a decision. 
So we call the minister, and it's quite extraordinary. We managed to call all three in the same morning, quite a long morning. And he said, well, actually, I'll go with what the committee says. <laughs> Deep breath. So what do you think? Well, let's go and see what you've got in terms of lab facilities, and then we'll decide there. So we took this piece off to the lab. And there's the piece slightly enlarged. So you've got to imagine something about this big. Okay. Just off to the lab. And I said, well, we're going to put it inside this machine, um, which is what we call a variable pressure X-ray fluorescence machine. And basically, it's going to analyze the surface of the gold in high magnification. It won't destroy it. It won't cook it, honest, because they're convinced that we're just going to cook this gold. And I said, you can see everything that's going on inside the chamber on this TV screen. And I had to admit, I didn't actually know what was going to happen next. And it's the first time we'd used this machine for a long time. So I was a little bit nervous, I have to say. And there's another little detail. So you've got this figure facing right, wearing a helmet and a chin strap. And he's holding a shield and a spear, and you've got, you know, it, and you're bedazzled by the gold. You just look at the gold and then the figure. And then you zoom in into the face of the warrior. And you realize lots of other subtle differences then appear. It was originally fully polychrome. His eyes reflected because he had something bright and probably reflective, like a cat's eye equivalent, inserted into his eyeball. Probably a little flick of glass or crystal. And the chin straps are, are hollow now, but were originally inlaid. And all of the, the cloisons, you know, the, 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 the sort of the rectangular cells that make up part of his skirt, and the hollows that form the branches uh, and the foliage of the columns on either side must also have originally been inlaid. So when we flipped it over, very carefully, of course, we found traces of an ancient repair on the back. And the composition of the repair on the back, which is ancient, is completely different to the gold composition of the main piece. And I think it's very clear that what we're dealing with is a circa 2nd century BC clasp, probably looted in antiquity at one of the great cities like Aichanum, looted when the Kushans came into the country in the 1st century BC, and then all of the inlay stripped out, possibly for reuse, the object damaged in the process, resoldered, and repurposed. And so this uh, uh, anomaly between the date of the object and the date of, date of deposition were now, I think, quite beautifully explained. From, and it was transformed from an item of polychromy into pure gold bling. Now, the last piece I'm going to illustrate in this little section on how things might have been made was another, another puzzle. And this was a part of a, a large group of Chinese, Roman, Indian, and possibly other um, objects excavated by French archaeologists at the site of Bagram in Afghanistan just before and during the Second World War. They date most people agree, to the end of the first or possibly the beginning of the second century AD. And they include a small number of small hollow glass flasks in the shape of dolphins. Now, it's clear glass, which is just weathered to this slightly nasty yellowish color, decorated with blue trails and spots for the eyes and the fins. Compositional analysis proves that the basic raw material to make this glass is a type of glass known as natron glass, which is typical of Egypt, Roman Egyptian production. 
And yet, there isn't a single known complete or even fragmentary example of this type of vessel known from anywhere in the Roman world, or indeed in Egypt itself. So the implication is that this piece was made outside the Roman world, but using Roman Egyptian glass. And this is entirely consistent with a source known as the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, which dates to the mid-first century AD, which includes, amongst other things, references to the export of glass, raw glass, from Roman Egypt to India. And it's always been assumed that this is for making beads or inlays or unknown objects. Now, I had a conversation with the late David Whitehouse from the Corning Museum of Glass in 2011, and he said, oh, I know what, I'll get Bill to make a copy. Bill Goodenrath, if you don't know him, is possibly the world's leading exponent of replicating ancient glass uh, in the studios at Corning. And he succeeded in making several very close copies of this piece and showed that the originals did not require any great glass blowing skill at all, and that the entire group known from the storerooms of Bagram were probably made in a single day. And we had this wonderful moment when he came to the BM I, and brought one of the replicas on the left, of course, and we plonked it down next to one of the originals. Um, and there, I don't know, sometimes we think of ancient objects as being very, very special because they're just because they're old. And I, I'm rather inclined to think sometimes you're dealing with failed wannabe masterpieces and gimmicks and, you know, tricks of the trade, really, for the gullible. And I, I have a feeling that this, these dolphins fall into that category. Um, and then we had a rather very unscripted moment where the deputy director of the Carbon Museum is sitting there <laughs> looking at this piece uh, along with curators from the Carbon Museum. And we filmed the process of it being made in Corning. And, it, and I have to say, it was the most popular video that the BM's ever streamed onto YouTube. Um, <laughs> if you go on, I think it's making a glass fish. If you Google that, you'll, you'll see the whole thing for yourself. Um, so the next sort of big question we all get asked is, what was it used for? Well, this is one of the most frus frustrating questions I always think in archaeology, because in the absence of any helpful in inscriptions on an object, and when we have an inscription, it's usually added, it's the name of the, the owner, or it's a piece of graffiti, it's not the name of the maker, uh, we have to sort of rely on intuition, analogies picked out of ethno-archaeology, or good old guesswork. And I think, you know, uh, we have to be a little bit critical with ourselves sometimes, because we're all common with these sort of terms in the archaeological literature, or even on, on labels that we write, saying something's a pourer, um, or a storage container, or a tool. And when one thinks about it, these are really useless words which you'd joke at if you went to a shop and asked for a tool uh, or a storage container. Um, you know, they're slightly meaningless, really. So, obviously, one of the ways we have, potentially, is to use things like organic chemistry and, and residue analysis to see if there are things still left in the pot to understand what it was used for. This is one of the golden, you know, the, the holy grails, if you like. And yet, you know, the analogy is washing the crime scene before the CSIs get there. You're, you're potentially losing a lot of evidence at the moment of excavation when we all scrub things to look at the decoration before we can number it. We're removing a lot of data, potentially. And with that question in mind, we've been looking at um, a set of vessels which are very typical of the early first millennium BC in northwestern Iran in the Iron Age, uh, which are, consist of jars with long spouts. So, you should think they're used in pouring. Um, 
Now, they're often found in graves. They're sometimes found in domestic contexts. But the functions of these vessels are not very clear. When you pick them up, if you pick them up by the handle, they're very unbalanced. But if you pick them up in two hands, one often finds that they are beautifully de uh, designed to deliver a very slow, constant pour, where the handle functions more as a hook, and the second hand rests, as it were, underneath the spout, where you often have this little <coughs> protuberance, as if it's under the, 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 under the neck of the, the, the spout that looks like a bird's head, if you like. So they seem to be designed for a purpose that's practical, but we just don't know what the practical purpose is. And when we analyzed them, we found that ex excavated pieces that we got in the collection were so contaminated by almost 100 years of handling by archaeologists, curators, students, and conservators, and excavators, that there was so much background noise, we couldn't separate that out from the original contents. So they were actually useless for residue analysis. So we looked at, we were generous enough to be given a few pots that had never been conserved in 2002. And we knew the previous history of them quite well. And when we analyzed those, as you can see, we found that there were traces of beeswax, um, fats, unidentifiable fats, and um, plant resins. And our conclusion is, therefore, that these jars were not just used for pouring water. They weren't used for pouring alcohol, because alcohol does give very strong signals in the residue. Uh, but instead were lined with beeswax. This is very common in areas where you don't have pitch or bitumen. And were used probably to contain oily materials, oily liquids. So the question is not totally resolved, but we know a little bit more of what they weren't used for. And that opens up possibilities for future analysis in the, uh, 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 elsewhere, perhaps. So the next big set of questions is, why does it look like that now? <laughs> the process of how an object was made or decorated, what it was made from, how it got buried, how it got cleaned, all affect the appearance of an object and its transformation, basically, from its intended original to its present. So bronze objects are now green instead of yellow. Silver tarnishes to dark gray. Gilt silver, where the contrast between the gold and the silver are removed and eliminated in cleaning, but become accentuated as an object changes through time. Perhaps that was deliberate in antiquity. Painted objects are even more challenging because paint is not normally just the, the raw material. It has a binder that holds it together. And the binders of paints, very well known from conservators who work on painted canvases, let's say, um, less well appreciated for archaeological objects, binders break down very easily. And with archaeologically painted objects, those binders, which are organic, break down as soon as they become in contact with light. And this explains a feature that one finds from the mid-19th century onwards. People like great explorers like Layard comment on I saw this painted surface, and the paint disappeared in front of my eyes. So the ancient world was very colorful. We know that in ancient Egypt. We know that in the classical world. We know that in India. But when you go to the Near East, we often find that the sculptures are very monochromatic. The ivories look very white. And we underestimate polychromy in the ancient Near East. That's our, that was our starting point. One of the things that's happened in recent years is imaging. And imaging that I'll show in a moment 
Um, we've been using some techniques developed by one individual, Giovanni Verri, in the Courtauld um, Institute of Art in London, um, that, and been working with us. And I'll read this bit out, because I can never remember this. I'm not a scientist. And he showed that when excited by radiation in the blue, green, or red region of the electromagnetic spectrum, one particular artificial pigment that we refer to as Egyptian blue shows intense radiation in one part of the infrared range. So if you've got a camera set up with the right kit, you will see, if there's no other external source of light, Egyptian blue on the computer screen. I know that's slightly hard to get across. But it's like the CSI effect of the luminol. <laughs> and we tried this in the BM one night with a lot of curiosity by our security department and not telling too many other people. We got permission, uh, three of us, to work all night in the galleries of the BM, isolating all the alarms, telling all the security teams that they couldn't come through with their torches. So we <laughs> got permission. And we looked at some later Syrian sculptures from the uh, um, Room 7 of Palace of Sargon at Hosabad, northern Iraq, um, dated very narrowly uh, between 721 and 705 BC, a site that may or may not have been partially destroyed by Daesh in recent months, uh, of which we have a small selection of sculptures in the BM from the 19th century. You can see red on them, and you can see some other stuff, but no one could work out what it was. So we used the imaging, switched off the lights, and the horse's head glowed in the dark. And it was all the areas that had been painted with Egyptian blue. And the results showed very clearly that they were painting on a gloopy um, liquid blue and alternating stripes of red and blue very purposefully across the horse harness on fragment after fragment. There was a systematic scheme of decoration of the, of the pieces. Now, the very close comparison of this color scheme at Horsabad compares very closely with contemporary late Assyrian wall paintings at a site called Tel... Tel um, Ahma to Basip, which was previously interpreted by um, Pauline Albender as dating again to the period of Sargon II. What we've concluded is that this was a very short lived use of Egyptian blue in Assyrian art because we found no evidence on earlier or later Assyrian sculptures employing Egyptian blue. So if you like, it's a failed color scheme, probably inspired by Egypt and abandoned. Now, we've extended this technique to later material um, in our collection, excavated in, again in the 19th century from a site called Uruk in southern Iraq, which was well known for having polychrome stuccos but also including stuccos that appeared bright white. You look at them under a microscope, you look at them in the naked eye, and they appeared bright white. And it looked as if they were, they were playing around with painted and unpainted stuccos of the same typological form. But when looked at in the infrared, you could see that all that was white was actually blue. And there is no plain white stucco um, that we've analyzed from Uruk. So this opens up another question, because one of the best known sites in Iran is a site called Kali Yazdegerd, um, which um, I mean, well known for its use of um, colored stuccos. And the excavator there commented on the wide use of yellow, intense green, deep blue, deep blue, red, medium violet, and shocking pink. And he contrasted that color scheme with the quote unquote, many plasters which show absolutely no signs of paint. 
well, I think we can guess at what, what those are. Um, but it, it sort of illustrates that really one shouldn't take anything for granted, even when you think you know what you're looking at. Now, I think the last case study I'm going to look at, because I'm now unaware of time, uh, concerns a number of carved ivory plaques, I say ivory plaques, which were originally attached to wooden furniture, again excavated by French archaeologists at Bagram in northern Afghanistan, dating to around the late first, early second century. Now, they're a collection of over a thousand such pieces divided between the museum in Kabul, the Guimet Museum in Paris, with a small number here in the US in Cleveland, presented to that museum by the excavator. Now, as you all know, the contents of the galleries as well as the storage areas of Kabul were heavily ransacked uh, during the 1990s and an estimated perhaps 70% of the collection was lost. And this certainly seems to apply, Gil may correct me, as, uh, after their cataloging process is finished, but it certainly seems to apply to the Bagram ivories. A, a lot, if not all, of those have gone. And they have disappeared uh, into different private collections. Now, in 2011, as Gil hinted at, we were very fortunate to be tipped off by uh, uh, an individual who said he knew where 20 of them were, and could we act as the intermediary for the return of these pieces? And we were fortunate, again, to receive a lot of sponsorship at very short notice from Bank of America Merrill Lynch, um, for, who were also sponsoring our exhibition on Afghanistan at that time, and were therefore able to do a lot of intensive conservation and science on this group of 20 so that we could anal analyze how they'd been conserved in the past, so that we knew how to reconserve them, how to analyze them for pigments, because that had never been done anywhere before, and make them safe for return to Kabul. So I'm going to close with these images. Um, we rushed out a little book um, to go uh, the accessible book, as some Gil called it, um, <laughs> with some key questions. What are the objects made of? They all get referred to as ivory, but we had a suspicion that some of them weren't ivory. And um, what was the extent of previous restoration? Uh, what are the materials used? Um, how fragile are they? Well, we knew they were very fragile because some of them looked like they'd been sat on by an elephant. I mean, they were fragmented into 100 pieces each. Um, and what pigments were used on them, other than what we could see with the, the naked eye? Now, I'll now just run through some of these things. The, the state of these, this unique collection of Indian ivories, when discovered, was already in a poor state. The ivory had desiccated, the wood on which they'd been mounted had disappeared, and they'd been fragmented by the weight of soil on them, and they were excavated in the heat of an Afghan summer. It's not a good combination of factors. Then they were, had conservation, then some of them went into the museum, and then some of them were literally ripped off the wooden boards on which they'd been displayed in Kabul for you know, illicit removal onto the market. So our first job was to try and identify which pieces they were and how they fitted onto the original furniture. So we had a piece on the right that, as you can see, fit, fits onto that drawing. We had another fragment of a chair leg that shows this little squatting mythological Indian figure, tree guardian, sitting underneath a pot. And we... Uh, uh, applied some of the techniques I've just mentioned. We use Raman spectroscopy, which is uh, firing a little laser beam pinpoint at the pigment points, and that feeds into a database, and it gives you the composition of the, the material compounds that you're looking at. And we used XRF for looking at particularly the metal work, and plots out lots of charts and graphs, which are very distinctive, and then you get the results, and that's what we're after. And we found that they're using several different pigments. So using carbon black, very cheap source of you know, soot, basically fine soot. 
to color the hair and the details of the eyes, and to accentuate the very shallow carving to really create actually quite a vivid sense of movement in something that is a, a very small piece of miniature art. I mean, suddenly they, they're a lot more vivacious as individuals when you see them blown up in detail and you see the pigment. I think they do come alive. We also found traces of a rather weird post-depositional substance that's not pigment, something in the soil probably. Looks like mold, but isn't. And then we also analyzed a dark, almost black pigment. It's often described as black in the catalogues. And it's actually indigo, better known as uh, a dye stuff, uh, exported in antiquity from India to Rome. We find it on palmyrene textiles, for instance. Um, but was also used as a colorant. And this is one of the earliest uh, instances for the identification of indigo in the Indian world. Uh, and a, a, a rather more costly red pigment, which we've um, proven is vermilion. So it's not red ochre, which is bog standard, but a, a slightly more vivid red created by this substance. And imaging suggests we were very careful. We couldn't sample this material. It belonged to Kabul. We were returning it to Kabul. In hindsight, we could have pressed harder with our colleagues to sample, but we decided not. We will use imaging. And it definitely showed that there is a fourth pigment. We believe it could be madder. Uh, it's a, therefore a plant dye. Um, but it, 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 we need access to more pieces which we can sample in the future. And it's that bit there. So. I'll end with that, really, because the results were extremely successful, I think, you know, as a pilot study. Um, two of the 20 so-called ivories were bone. Um, they are very fragile. They need to be treated carefully. There were multiple layers of conservation, basically dating from the 1930s or 40s through the Soviet period of conservation in Afghanistan in the 70s through to black market interventions uh, when they were in different private hands. Um, um, and we were basically trying to unpick a lot of those, that stratigraphy of conservation down as far as we could to the real object. Um, we find often that they've got metal pins, which were originally used to fix them to the furniture, uh, which are a mixture of bronze and brass. And probably a, that in itself is a reflection of metal recycling industries in India at that period. We know a lot more about the pigments and therefore a lot more about polychromatic Indian ivories than has ever been shown before. And the final, in this case, great success story was that we were able to keep this story out of the press even after the press launch of the exhibition. This was a real triumph of subterfuge whereby all the journalists were convinced that we were behind schedule. And so when they came to the exhibition press launch, they just didn't ask questions about why the last case was empty. And um, the reason for this is that we had the press launch. We got lots of good publicity on the exhibition. And then we brought the ivories across London from our labs, installed them, had an exclusive lined up for the Monday morning newspapers, and had effectively a second bite at that cherry, which precipitated more press as they all came back for a second feeding frenzy. And uh, immediately before the Olympics, before the, the air window on London effectively shut down, and the, uh, what they call the Central Asia Plan section of the British Army that were extricating ISAF out of Afghanistan, were given the responsibility for managing the security of the London Olympics, those guys um, worked with us to basically fly this cargo into Kabul uh, that Gil mentioned. And that's where those pieces are very safely held to go on display at some point soon, we hope. And on that note, I think I'm going to end.
Thank you.